Hello, Oscillator Sync here. If you've followed me on YouTube for a while, you've been well within your rights to assume that big, washy, ambient reverbs, or maybe delays feeding back to infinity were my favorite kinds of effects. And while they're high up in the pecking order, my first and truest love will always be distortion. As far as the videos I've made for this channel go, I feel like I might have been neglecting my number one. So today I'd like to put this right and dedicate a whole video to distortion, clipping, saturation and the like. Talk about what it is, what it does, its varied flavors, and how we can approach using it in the world of electronic music. As it's the world that I feel most inspired to work within, this video will mostly be spent exploring these ideas in the hardware realm, but they apply equally in the box. And actually, to introduce some of these key ideas, it's gonna be easier to start in software. So let's head over there now. I want to start by talking about a type of distortion, which I think is probably the easiest to visualize and conceptualize, which is pure digital clipping. And to that end, uh, welcome to Pure Data or PD for short. It is a graphical modular DSP programming environment. You don't need to really worry too much about what's going on here in order to understand the clipping part of it. But if you are interested in checking out these programs, I will put a link to them in the description of the video. In digital audio, all sound is represented by a sequence of numbers, and those numbers dictate the shapes of the waves that are recorded or played back, and therefore what we hear. We usually think about these numbers as going from a particular positive number up down to a particular negative number, but there is a minimum and maximum number that can be represented. And if you try to push a waveform beyond that minimum or maximum number, rather than going any higher, the numbers will clamp to the particular minimum and maximum, and that will shear off the top or the bottom of the waveform. So let's um, take a look at that. We've got a um, sine wave here, uh, which you can see uh, visualized here. We can also see down here, we have a spectrum analyzer. So we can see a single peak here, which is the fundamental frequency of this sine wave. This control here is going to allow me to add gain to this sine wave, which will essentially, to begin with, just make it louder. And I'll just turn down the master volume here so we don't blow our ears up. And as long as I don't try and amplify this uh, sine wave beyond the minimum or maximum that I have set for this system, it will just get louder. We'll just hear a louder sine wave. But as we push this towards the maximum, which I've just set to be one as it happens. So still a sine wave. And then eventually if we push it a little bit louder, there we go. We've pushed it beyond the maximum loudness that this digital system is going to allow. And rather than it getting any bigger, instead it started to shear off the top and the bottom of the waveform, which has essentially changed the shape of the wave. And as that wave shape changed, we could hear a change in the frequency content. There's no longer just a pure sine wave. There are upper, brighter harmonics being introduced. And if we push this gain higher and higher, pushing it further and further past the limit, we can hear that we're getting a complete change to our sound. And if we push it high enough, we see all of these new harmonics starting to get introduced and eventually we get a square wave, which I'll just turn down there. And we can see all of these additional harmonics here. We can see this sine wave because we've pushed it past the maximum value that we're allowed in our digital audio system. We now have a square wave. So in this case, clipping our sine wave is introducing more harmonics, more frequencies. It's making it a brighter sound, which is kind of like opening up a filter. It kind of has that vibe to it, even if that's not really what we're doing, rather than us having a filter which was taking away high end, clipping it is introducing the high end. And in fact, um, if we just connect this up here to here, um, this is just a really simple uh, envelope that I've created. Uh, so rather than having it on a slider, it's now going to be an envelope. And this is going to sound a little bit like... Mm -hmm. 
us sort of opening up a, a filter quickly and letting it decay, right? A similar sort of vibe. We're not um, cutting out frequencies. Instead, we are introducing frequencies at the top end. Of course, the nature of the clipping is going to be different depending on what our input is. So um, rather than this sine wave, let me just unplug that from the system and instead plug in this sawtooth. I'll just uh, also turn it down a little bit because sawtooths are a little bit harsher on the ears. Uh, I'm also going to just quickly do that. Don't worry about that just for a second. Um, and we can see here that we've got a sawtooth wave much richer in terms of its frequency content even than the square wave. But if we go to amplify it past that clipping point and start to shear off the tops and bottom, we again get a new waveform and a different sound. Now the interesting thing when we've taken this more harmonically rich waveform and clipped off the top and bottom is that it's not really getting any brighter per se instead the emphasis of the uh, frequencies that are in there is changing as we go between a sawtooth and a square wave so when we are clipping things we're not always making them brighter necessarily but we are changing the relative uh, frequency amounts that are found within them. Now, just uh, for your interest, uh, one of the other things that we can do with clipping is um, rather than clipping things equally on the top and bottom, we can apply an offset to a wave so that it lives more within the top end, so closer to plus one or closer to negative one, which means that as we apply gain, only one side of the waveform gets clipped at first, which means we get a different shape and therefore a different sound. And check this out. What does this look like as we start to move this waveform that's being clipped up and down? Apply a little bit more gain. Hey look, it's pulse width modulation. So one way to get a pulse width modulatable square wave is to start with a sawtooth wave, distort it, and then apply a DC offset to move it up and down, therefore clipping each side of the waveform differently. Which is pretty interesting, I think. So when we clip really simple signals like a pure waveform, uh, we are just kind of changing the wave shape, which gives us a, a new sound. What's interesting is when we start to work with more complex sounds, so here I've just got th uh, four different sine waves all going at different frequencies. As we start to distort it, we start to become more aware of another um, aspect of distortion, which is that it is not just about a tonal change, it's a dynamic change as well. So as we push this towards clipping, we can start to hear almost like a rhythm. So what's happening here? Well, all of these oscillators are running at different frequencies, but there are going to be points within the cycles of each of these oscillators where they are reinforcing each other and pushing it harder above this clipping point, which starts to introduce rhythms based around the dynamics of our sounds within the sounds. So often when we start to apply clipping to signals, we start to hear interactions between sounds that were not necessarily obvious when we listen to them normally. And as we push this harder, you can kind of hear this beating that lives within these frequency relationships weren't necessarily obvious to begin with. And again, if we were to offset this signal, then we would get a different flavor. And actually, because of the complex interactions that are being created by the harmonics generated by the clipping, we almost start to hear notes which weren't there before. 
that note there isn't actually in our input. It's just being created because of the relationships between these frequencies and the way that they are being clipped. Again, nothing beyond clipping and offset is being used here, but we're finding new sounds within our sounds. Even within the simplest form of distortion, just shearing off the top of a waveform, we can find these very complex relationships. Finally here I've got a uh, loop. Just some piano and some choir samples here. A far more complex signal than the oscillating, beating sine waves that we had before. And as we start to clip off the signal, again, with this more complex uh, input, we start to hear more complex interactions from within the sound that the clipping is making clearer to us. We're getting tonal and dynamic changes, which is one of the things that is so magic about distortion. And again, we have our offset here that we can apply, clipping one side more than the other, what we sometimes call asymmetrical clipping. And we get different flavors and emphasis moving towards the mid-range. And we get granted very harsh sounds or sounds that we here as being harsh but you are emphasizing all of those interesting interactions and if we just take a simple filter take out some of that harshness but keep those interactions I think there's a real fragile beauty that we start to uncover within our source that we might not have otherwise heard sorts of sounds being used by the likes of Nine Inch Nails. That's where a lot of that interesting texture comes from in those sorts of tracks. Distortion. Finding these new relationships within the sounds that you wouldn't otherwise hear. But hey, let's head over to some hardware, shall we? The hard digital clipping we just heard affects the input signal in a precise, easy to predict way. The process is a purely linear mathematical one. When we move into the realm of analog distortion or digital distortion, which is modeling it, the relationship between the input signal and the distorted output becomes a lot more complex. Most distortion circuits are based around electrical components operating at the edge of, or even beyond their intended parameters. This introduces all kinds of non-linearities and quirks into their operation, which can be affected by the input signal's volume, frequency content, the impedance presented by the instrument plugged into the distortion, even the temperature. There are many different ways to build a distortion circuit, and each of them introduces different kinds of non-linearities. In some cases, simply switching out a single component in the circuit, like a different transistor, can vastly change the way that the circuit behaves. The world of distortion pedals then is like jelly beans, hundreds of different flavors because of the different circuit designs. Some of them are fairly similar, but subtly different. Like you might prefer toffee flavor over caramel, but either will probably do if you're after that rich, soft, dark, sugary taste. Then you have those huge contrasts uh, like caramel and sour lemon, uh, where you'll probably be craving one rather than the other. These three pedals here were kindly sent over by Empress FX in order to help me demonstrate what are probably, broadly speaking, the three major flavors of distortion pedal that you might come across. What I'm about to describe are broad generalizations and there's more of a Venn diagram than distinct separate entities. But um, represented here on the desk, uh, we have a overdrive pedal, 
Overdrive pedals tend to be a lower gain or the lowest gain of the major types of distortion pedals. They are often designed to complement the input signal rather than completely transform it, if you like. A word that you see associated with some overdrive pedals is this idea of transparent, uh, which is a badly defined word in terms of what we're talking about here, I guess. But that generally means is that you can kind of hear the original uh, sound that's been plugged into it, usually a guitar, but in our case, it's going to be a synth, but with that sort of fur and grit around it. Moving up the chain of gain from overdrive pedals, we get to the generic distortion pedal. Not that this particular pedal is particularly generic, has to be said. Um, distortion pedals tend to be higher gain than overdrive pedals. They tend to be more transformative of the sound, more of that waveform getting crushed and changed. Um, that being said, uh, distortion pedals are usually designed uh, in such a way that the input and the output of the sound is a little bit more sculpted in the uh, frequency domain, which means that it's, um, although very high gain, tends to be quite well behaved and controllable. Uh, often uh, a sound that you might um, associate with the distortion panels is that smoothing of the waveform, although there's maybe lots of high high end energy in there, it's kind of in a, in a smooth way um, compared to um, some other types of pedals. Which brings me neatly on to the third broad flavor of pedals here, which is fuzz. Historically speaking, fuzz pedals actually came first. They tended to be designed uh, around more uh, simplistic circuits, although that's not always necessarily the case these days. But um, the way that they achieve their gain, which is usually even higher gain than the um, distortion pedals, was much more the misuse of the components, which um, led to more texture and unpredictability. Um, fuzzes tend to be the most uh, unruly of all of the pedals, um, much more dependent on the input as to what they're going to do. So whether they can react fast to transients or not, there might be squashing and spluttering sounds that you associate with fuzz. Much more textured, unpredictable, um, but that could be where a lot of the real character can be found when you are looking at uh, distortion pedals. As I say, those are sort of generalizations. And as I was here talking about sort of textured sounds with the fuzz pedals, you may well find, as we might find here with the, uh, the, the germ drive here, that actually the idea of textured sounds could be found in overdrives or distortions. So we're talking about a Venn diagram here, and there's often significant overlap in some of these ideas. Um, but I tell you what, let's stop talking and actually hear them, shall we? So I've grabbed the mini log here um, because I wanted something that was sort of uh, a good basic sound for us to uh, crush. And I've got a patch here, which is just a single triangle wave. You can hear there's a little bit of fluff on the mini logs triangle wave, uh, but otherwise that is our sort of clean sound as it were. The filter is wide open. The envelope is opening and closing instantly. Um, and it's only one oscillator, so a really basic sound. So let's see, just on single notes, what each of these devices, set as they currently are, are going to do to that sound. So let's start at the lowest gain here with the germ drive. We'll just turn that on. I've got the gain fairly low on this. And on those single notes, you can hear that the sort of basic sound of the synth is not being completely obliterated. Just a little bit of, I guess what you would call sort of fattening, some of the top end has actually been rolled off there a little bit. And there's a little bit of warmth, fluff, um, sort of low end distortion happening there, which is um, very um, pleasant on those single notes, just for sort of creating a more lo-fi sound. So uh, let's move up the gain uh, here to the uh, heavy here, which is our distortion. And we'll just use the heavy channel, which is the lower gain of the two channels, but still pretty high gain. I've got the gain set at pretty low here. But you can hear even with that lower gain, uh, a massively more transformed sound as opposed to the overdrive. And especially, I guess at the lowest and highest, there, you can really hear those upper harmonics being introduced there. 
I'm intentionally not playing chords at the moment. We will get to chords, don't worry. Um, uh, I'm moving up once again to the fuzz here again. I've got the gain set fairly conservatively here. Uh, so let's have a listen. So just reminding, that's our original sound. So again, um, we're hearing much more transformation. It's sounding a lot more square wavy. You can also hear, especially on these lower notes, maybe if we go even lower, that there's kind of a, a texture to the sound which wasn't so obvious on the distortion. Cool. So that was just single notes. Uh, but as we saw when we were playing in pure data, when we provide distortion uh, more uh, complex inputs, so in our case, maybe chords, uh, we get more uh, complex interactions that might be more interesting. So let's give that a go, shall we? So what I'll do initially, I think, is just build up like a, 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 a major chord like that, just to see um, how these different pedals affect more complex inputs. So here we go. Let's try the Germanian drive first. So there we just have our little warming. Let's try that in different octave. That's lovely. That's our input. doing to the sound. All of those interactions between the different frequencies are being um, emphasized and where there are little misfirings in the tuning of the synth because it's VCO based so there, there, there are slight tuning issues between each of the notes part what gives it its quality its uh, character they're all being emphasized in a really lovely way. I think you're rewarded with more simple relationships as well. Like that fifth there just gains a whole uh, other world of uh, sounds in it. Anyway, let's try the same thing with our distortion. Things get very crunchy. Very crunchy indeed. Uh, let's try simpler relationships again. These high notes are really popping. Hmm, interesting. A um, little bit crunchier, a um, little less um, able to be reeled in, I think. Let's try the fuzz. Same idea. A square wave sound immediately. Hmm. I really love the germanium drive though. Let's try that with a little bit more gain, shall we? See what, what that does as we turn up the gain. It's got that kind of um, almost Hammond organ distortion thing going on there, which is really cool. those relationships between those notes. Just the little fluctuations in frequency and the way that they're beating against each other. Lovely stuff. So something I was just doing there which uh, sounded pretty cool uh, was sweeping the gain control as uh, almost like a tone control, a change of the timbre of the sound. Um, but of course we can do that in our synths um, by modulating the 
amp envelope. Uh, so if we have the uh, volume of our sound swoop in and then swoop out with the gain turned up high, it's going to be basically the same as us turning the gain knob up and down and getting that timbre change. Let's set the gain a little bit higher here. And let's set kind of a paddy uh, swoop to our uh, sound here. Uh, something like that will do. Um, so uh, the clean sound now sounds like this. Just a basic triangle pad sound. No modulation or anything on there. Only thing we're doing is sweeping the amp envelope. Now with the gain turned up higher on our pedal now, gonna get a bit of noise because that's the nature of higher gain devices. Um, now we should hear that we get a timbre change, not just a volume change. <laughs> That's a cool sound. Let's try that with a sawtooth wave instead, see what that sounds like. Really sounds like there's a, a filter on there, right? Turn the gain down a little bit. that those additional sounds that are being sort of um, faded in then affect the overall tonality as well, almost like we're getting ghost notes that aren't even being played. What a fantastic sound. And reminder, this is what we're actually playing. Let's try that with the fuzz. Again. Almost like this. Almost like guitar feedback. The way that those notes fight against each other. Let's try some really high notes, see how that sounds like. Some really low notes. <laughs> and again, just as a reminder, that's our input. And it's all about the sounds being smushed together into one cohesive whole, while at the same time the smallest changes making kind of bigger differences as well. A great example of small changes making big differences. Um, on the Moonlog we have the, our shape control. It's actually a wave folder on the uh, triangle wave, and if we 
like that. That's our input. these paddy patches that we've been playing with on the min logger of course fun uh, but a classic way of using distortion with synths of course is to smash up a bass line so we could take this sort of pseudo 303 friend here and we could engage one of our distortion pedals and get something a lot more fun and interesting and what's really um great about distorting these sorts of um bass lines is that uh, we still have this idea of the small changes making big differences kind of thing. Um, so as we adjust our filter settings and our filter envelope settings, it has a much bigger impact. Which is all fun. But that's more fun. just that without the distortion. Just try the fuzz. See the fuzz is introducing so many additional harmonics. Oh. That's cool. That's the input. Mad, right? Almost not audible, but with all that gain. Almost sounds like there's a, a pitch change, like there might be uh, feedback inside the fuzz circuit that's being tweaked by, wow. That's our input. Almost like a kick drum pitch envelope. Yeah, that resonance is really messing with it. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> See, the overdrive is a lot more well behaved. Still adding loads of vibe. Again, almost inaudible <laughs> without the distortion, but it's absolutely part of the synthesis process here. So let's try some distortion with a drum machine. So I've got the Drum Brute Impact here, which does have its own distortion circuit built in, but it's only one flavor of distortion. And as we've seen, there are multiple flavors to be had. So this is the uh, sound that I've got going on here, just a beat that sounds like this. What I've tried to do here is create a beat which has a, uh, a combination of um, space but also stuff which is overlapping as well uh, because that's where we'll be able to hear what the distortion is actually doing so let's try the germ drive first of all so with a low gain just 
it is just immediately better, right? If you give it a bit of bit of distortion, a bit more texture to the low end. And essentially, we, 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 we're doing compression to the drums, which is something that you would tend to do with a, a drum machine anyway, so you would compress it to get a bit more punch to it. We're kind of getting that for free because of the distortion. The dynamic's a bit squashed, but you still got the thwack of the, the kick there nicely. Give it more gain. Yeah, as we start to increase that gain, first thing that I noticed straight away is that the kick drum has got more of a tone to it now. We're hearing the note, if you like, of the kick a bit more. Because of those upper harmonics being emphasized, we've got more of the note information to grab hold of. But things are getting a lot more squashed now as well. And I think what's really interesting is if you listen to how like the hi-hats and the kick and the snare are interacting with each other and sort of fighting for space in a really cool way. Like that kick snare at the end there. That snare sound at the end there is actually the same as the snare in the middle, right? But the way that the kick and the snare are fighting for space within the distortion makes that second snare, the one at the end, that one there sound completely different to the first one. Much more spitty. Because that low end energy from the kick is still there distorting things when it's happening. Let's try a different uh, pedal. Let's try the heavy now, the distortion. Here you can hear um, what I was talking about um, right at the start when we introduced the pedals. The distortion pedals tend to um, uh, filter the input and the output a bit more than, uh, say, fuzzes or overdrives to constrain and control what's going on. Everything here is a lot more mid-focused. Had the highs turned down a little bit there, but... The overdrive is more sort of full range. A lot more mid-focused with the distortion here. Still really cool things going on. The little toms in there now sound really, really cool. Whereas they're a little bit lost in the dry sound, or even with the overdrive. Like that second low tom at the end there, you can barely hear with the overdrive, but with the This might be a really cool sound to mix in with the overall sound. The nice thing on the, uh, the heavy, and we'll talk about this a bit more in, uh, in a minute uh, when we look at samples, but we also have this weight control, which is a sort of pre-emphasis of the low end. So it's not a, uh, an EQ at the end, it's an EQ going into the pedal. And it means that the low end is going to sort of have more uh, effect on the distortion. As we turn it up, check out what happens. We get more low end, but the way that that low end is distorting. So cool. Those low sounds, those low toms and the kicks are completely in control of the whole vibe of the beat now. As we push that up even more, emphasizing those lows going in and of course we do this with a filter before the distortion which we'll do it with the samples in a minute the kicks take precedence over preference over everything else completely transforming it that pre-emphasis of the low is so cool Yes. Wow. Let's leave the fuzz a go as well. Okay, I've got the gain cranked here. And you can hear that the pedal is barely hanging on to the sound. Like everything, almost like, uh, it sounds like uh, a compressor is opening up after the kick 
only once that kick has sort of died down that there's even any space for other sounds to come through. And those toms are really electronic now. Like if we don't crank it as hard, we can get similar ideas to what we have with the other pedals, but... Really transformative, completely changing the dynamics of the sound, not just the tone. Because distortion is dynamic and tonal. Great stuff. Now, um, a lot of the cool artifacts that we're getting there is because we are running the entire sound into the distortion and each of those individual sounds are then affecting each other sort of within the distortion. But in a lot of cases, that might not be what you, what you want. Maybe what we were getting with the kick drum is really, really cool, but we don't want it completely stepping over the hi-hats or maybe uh, the real low-end weight that we were getting with the heavy uh, is taking away from the, uh, the snap of the snare or something like that. Well, if we have a device or if we're just working in a multi-track environment where we are able to distort different parts of the sound differently, we can get very different results to distorting it altogether. So here I've got a setup, um, excuse all the wires everywhere, where I have um, currently uh, got this beat as before, and the output is just going into the fuzz here. So we've got this vibe going on here. So everything's going through here, so everything is interacting with uh, each other. Uh, but perhaps it is that we don't want uh, maybe the kick and the snare to be um, affected by the other sounds or to affect the other sounds. So um, what I've got uh, around the back here is um, some cable set up so that I can send the kick through the uh, overdrive and the snare through the heavy here. So let me just plug those in. So now I have it set up with um, the kick going through here, the snare going through here and everything else, the main outputs going through here. So if we hit play, we basically get our original sound as it were, but now we can um, distort the different bits um, individually uh, so they're not all stepping on each other. So if we want to get that crunchy snare, we can get it. If we want to get that big uh, distorted kick, And if we want to bring in that uh, other uh, distortion on everything else. But now uh, each of the, I guess, the two main elements of the beat are not stepping over the others. So that's with things uh, done separately. with everything distorted together. How we can mix and match how those all work and we can affect them separately. flexibility by distorting things separately but the flip side of that is that we potentially lose some of that character of the things interacting with each other so it's kind of what are you trying to do with your distortion at a particular time And we can take a similar idea with the individual outs and apply it to um, melodic synth patches as well. Uh, for example, on the um, distortion here, um, although... These sort of individual notes sounded um, really great when we play them individually, uh, perhaps when we layer them up into a chord, things were a bit much, but of course in a multi-tracked environment in our door or even to tape if that's your thing, um, we can take this sound and break up into its individual parts and layer them instead. So uh, we could take 
and layer them up. So just a little change of scene here over to the modular to talk about another way to use distortion, which I think is really interesting. So um, I have here a mono loop being played back. Uh, so this is just the clean mono loop um, unprocessed. And what I want to talk about here is using multiple distortions to create stereo images from a, um, a mono source. So I've got Tercy uh, Marina here from uh, uh, Noise Engineering, uh, which is three distortion circuits in one uh, tiny little module. It's a great module. Um, and what I've done is I've taken um, this mono loop I've patched it into one of the inputs of Tercy, which molds it across the ones below it. And I've taken the output from two different distortion circuits into the left and right output of my system here. So if we turn down uh, the mono original here, and now hear the um, same sample, mono sample, being processed in stereo by both sides of Tercy here. And you can hear here that it's gained this really quite wide stereo image. And I think there's probably some phase stuff happening in here, but because the two distortions are grabbing onto the front end of notes or pushing up the back end of the reverb in different ways, and there are different frequencies that have been emphasized within the distortion, we get this quite interesting wide stereo image from our mono source. You can hear the reverb is uh, lingering in the left hand side and the front of the notes are getting squashed a lot more on the right hand side. The right hand side is a lot more about the front end of the note and the left hand side has become more about the tail of the note. And it's a really interesting way to up um, the stereo width on a mono source. I promise you this is still a purely mono source and I'd be interested to see what happens if we just put the mono back down the middle as well, it'd be interesting. Yeah, so a mono source which we have very much turned into something a lot more stereo. I think that's a really interesting way to approach making use of multiple distortions. And just while we're here in modular land, I've just patched uh, this patch up. Um, and it's based around just the triangle wave being sequenced here. It's just a straight triangle wave. And I've molted that into um, a bunch of low pass gates. And those low pass gates are going into different channels of um, Tercy here. And with that, we can um, take that one sequence. And because each of the different distortion circuits are going to shape the wave differently, by pinging into each of them with the low pass gates, we can get a stereo sort of multi-part uh, baseline going on here. So we've got that one there, that one there, and that one there. And we've got this kind of multi-part uh, thing. It sounds like there are kind of um, three different sounds going on here, but they're all just the same sound being distorted differently and then if we add in you know we can get somewhere right just off a single triangle wave being distorted uh, three different ways 
So one thing that's always really interesting to distort uh, is samples. Um, samples, especially loops like this one, already have a lot of those complex interactions built into them uh, for the distortion to take hold of and find all of those interesting clashes for it to emphasize and pull out those new sort of ideas. Um, what I want to talk about in particular here, um, uh, rather than the samples per se, is the power of pre-filtering your input in order to fine-tune uh, what you're getting from your distortion. So um, I'll use the germ drive because I think honestly it's my favorite. And one thing we can hear pretty immediately there is that the low notes, those low frequencies which carry more energy, are distorting more and kind of obscuring the other parts of the sound. Case in point just there. To the detriment of the, um, of the sample, I think. So one thing we would probably think about in the case of this sample, if we wanted to have the crunch, um, but maybe a bit more clarity, is to take out some of the bottom end before it gets the distortion pre-filter uh, what we're doing here. So let's try that on uh, the dig attack here. We can come over to the filter page and we can take out some of those low end. Although those low notes are blooming a little bit into the distortion, everything is a lot more controlled. Just by taking out some of those, those low frequencies here, we're able to get the character of the distortion without those low notes completely obscuring the other parts of our sample. And we can use this idea to emphasize other parts of the sound to make them distort more as well. We can bring down some of the, uh, the high end here as well, and maybe emphasize some of these low notes instead. Perhaps that's something we want to make a feature of instead. So now those twinkly highs aren't going in there so much. So perhaps if we were working with uh, the fuzz instead, naturally emphasizes a lot of those high-end harmonics more, we might want to focus more on the mid-range. We might find when we come over to the uh, distortion here, which pre-shapes its input a bit more, Although it's blowing out the bottom end a bit, it's not as blown out as it was with the overdrive, which is a more full range input. So the distortion, um, as we've discussed, tends to pre-shape the inputs to take out some of those low frequencies so that we don't get that massive blowout on the low end so much, even without any filtering going on on the dig attack here. Still some emphasis at the low end, but nowhere near as much as there was on the overdrive here. But certainly a different flavour of distortion. With the gain low. Yeah, just a little bit of crunch. So pre-filtering your sounds to make the best of them for your particular distortion device is something that's definitely worth considering. <laughs> 
fun as messing around with dirt pedals is, there are definitely some things to bear in mind as you explore this universe of game. The first thing I'd like to mention is that most of these pedals are designed for use with instrument level inputs. Guitar pickups generate a voltage in the low hundreds of millivolts. Electronic instruments like synths tend to operate at line level which will usually be up around 1 volt. What this hotter signal means in practice is, if you want to get the full range of gain from a dirt pedal, you'll probably have to turn down the synth or, as I did with the individual outputs on the drum brutes, run attenuators before the dirt pedals. Your rack levels are even hotter, and while you're probably unlikely to damage a pedal with these levels, I'd definitely play it safe and run an attenuator before the pedal or get a dedicated pedal interface. Tangentially related to this, some classic fuzz circuits are designed with the load impedance presented by a guitar pickup expected on the input, so they may misbehave with something like a synth plugged in. Usually this means sounding very compressed, lacking variation across the gain range, and a bit congested or gated, which might be your thing, but it does limit the usefulness a bit. Circuits based around the fuzz face design, for example, will often behave this way. Next up, most, if not almost all, distortion pedals are mono devices. This might not matter to you depending on the synth you're using, it certainly wasn't an issue for us today on the Minilog and the Drum Brute, but if you want to have uniform distortion across a stereo source, especially relevant on drum machines with panning I think, then your options are pretty slim. The only two I can think of off the top of my head is the Operation Overlord from Electroharmonics, and if you count them, uh, the Electron Analog Heat and the Otto Bomb, but those two do represent a pretty large jump in price. You can always work around this with running each side of a stereo source back out through your audio interface after tracking, or indeed just using two distortion pedals, but if you're looking for stereo dirt in a live rig, options are slim on the ground. I for one would warmly welcome a stereo version of the Germ Drive Empress if you're listening. Please. In Eurorack we definitely have a few more options, especially if we factor in VCAs that will overdrive. The Ruina Versio from Noise Engineering and the neat little guillotine from Ritual Electronics come to mind, but I'm sure Modular Grid will point you towards a bunch of other options. The other problem for us synth types is that, wow, there are a lot of distortion pedals out there. I wasn't joking with the Jelly Bean analogy, there are hundreds upon hundreds of options out there, and frankly, not that many of them have good demos for electronic instruments available online. Hopefully this will change over time. It's worth checking out guitar demos at least to get a feel for the game range or any special tonal features. Of course, many of these issues go away if you're working in the box where gain staging, stereo plugins, and an easy way to trial sounds exists. And there are a huge range of distortion plugins out there, just as there are pedals. There are also many plugins out there which seek to emulate specific real world pedals, so this might be a great way to get a feel for what works for you before shelling out on the hardware units. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration of dirt and electronic instruments, and maybe it inspired you to go and experiment with distortion in your own music. As always, if you enjoyed the video, a like is massively appreciated, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming synth fun. Until next time, Take care. Bye-bye.